Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Sports. I am Ralph Lavella. And I'm Ron Sen. Every week, the sports world gives us lots of gifts, and this week is no exception. We're going to start with Jonathan Sutherland, one of the captains on Penn State, who got a nasty letter from a fan complaining about his uh, dreadlocks and saying how he really wanted clean-cut players like they used to have in the old days. And his coach, James Franklin, stood up for him and said, He's one of our captains, he's one of our best players, he's a dean's list student, he's articulate, he's everything you really want in a college athlete. And the, the fan is saying, well, I didn't mean it to be racist. Well, unfortunately, whether you meant it or not, that's how it came off. What do you have, long hair like um, yeah. Lawrence? Yeah, you had long hair with a lot of the black players have these days. And you got long, uh, guys like Winovich have long hair, it's just not, it's not in dreads, but it could be. Nope. I just don't think it, hair is a big deal. Obviously, there was an issue years ago at uh, Mystic Valley where a couple of girls on the track team were suspended from the track team because I think they had hair extensions or something. And it became a major issue. I don't really have any issue about how kids wear their hair. I mean, I, mean, I don't, you know, I'm not, 30 years old or 20 years old anymore. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not going to look really great. I mean, I didn't, like, oh, I didn't like the way Ojale looked the other night. Oh, I didn't see the game. You know, I felt he looked like a clown, but anybody who, but that's just my feeling. I mean, nowadays it really doesn't matter. I don't know if there are any kind of standards in high school as far as what, what players can or can't. I doubt there are. And the Yankees still, do the Yankees have mush, they no, have just no mustaches for a while. Right. Do they still have that? No beards and no long hair. I mean, I like that in the Yankees. I like that. That's their policy, and the players know that. They look, they look to me, sharp. I mean, they're not, but again, you know, that's been years since I've been watching that. And, you know, but I, I don't like the way Ojale looked. He had, like, spikes coming out of his head. You know, and I'm saying to myself, but that's nowadays, I guess. Well, uh, to me, it's just not a, a, a big issue. Now, also in professional sports, Rockets general manager Daryl Morey had comments about the protests of uh, pro-democracy in Hong Kong, and there's been blowback on that in uh, China. The, some of the facilities where they had posters of the Rockets and so forth, they have uh, painted over the Rockets uh, logos and the uh, NBA preseason games are being taken off national TV over there. But the Rockets will get $1.5 billion a year from them? Really? From, from China. It's, I heard it today. The NBA is getting $5 billion, whatever it is, for advertising and all that. And the Rockets are getting $1.5 billion. It, it's possible that because Yao Ming was on the Rockets, that the Rockets yeah. developed a following. So then, obviously, uh, equipment sales uh, especially jerseys are really big in China. One, one of the reasons the Patriots have a presence in China is they want to be not just America's team, they want to be China's team because there's so many darn people there that that's a lot of money on jerseys. Well, a lot of people are hammering um, Smith, they're hammering um, a couple of coaches, Popovich, Kerr, they're hammering them and they're talking about human rights. Well, well they asked Kerr about the situation and he said, I really haven't researched it enough to have an opinion about this, the specifics. He said, although my brother-in-law is a professor, I think of Chinese history, and he said, I'm gonna talk to him about it and try to become more educated, and then I'll have an answer for you. You believe him? You, you're telling me he doesn't know well, I, I about think the human rights that are being violated over there? Maybe not enough that he He's feels gotta like he can run. talk. I mean, I know that. Well, it's a little bit, but what you, what you know I heard a story years ago about um, a guy was applying for, uh, for a job with a major Wall Street firm. And the, the uh, guy was talking to the head guy, and there was a picture of Tenement Square with the guy in front of the tank. And the interviewer said, we don't want people like this guy who are not concerned about risk management. And the guy said, I'm that guy. So you never know who you're going to be talking to. Ben Watson, who the Patriots signed as their replacement tight end after Gronkowski's retirement, uh, was, did not have his contract uh, renewed or activated after his four-game suspension. 
most people feel it's not necessarily performance related, but cost because the Patriots were getting up against the salary cap. They were under $2 million. Now we all know that teams can renegotiate contracts and uh, manipulate the cap in a thousand ways, but it seemed that uh, Lacoste and Izzo had a reasonable weekend and it, they probably just didn't feel it was worth the money. I think they're getting a lot better from what I saw. Izzo looks really good. He has really good hands. You know, makes a lot of tough catches. I think Brady's starting to get comfortable with him. And Lacoste, he dropped the first pass to him, made a nice reception on another one. Twice Lacoste was open, wide open, but Brady was under big time pressure. True to him, but true it low. Right. So you got to think that between the two of them, they get six receptions a game. And that's going to be great, I think. Well, neither of them are great blockers. And kind of interesting weekend in that you saw that. Uh, Kansas City got upset by the Colts, and the Colts ran for a ton of yardage against Kansas City, which has injury problems too, but the Colts have an outstanding offensive line. And last night, the uh, 49ers ran for about 250 yards on the ground and just totally blew Cleveland out. So maybe there's some changes happening in the NFL gradually that the running game is starting to come back into play. Yeah, Kansas City, I mean, they, Hill's not back yet. Um, the other receiver, the other real good receiver got hurt Oh, early. Sammy Watkins. Watkins got hurt early, so you could see a big difference there. But, you know, it, it was good to see them lose. So you, you got to think they're going to lose at least one more game, probably the Patriots. The Patriots beat them when they played them, you know, and then the Patriots can lose two games and still get the number one seed. And I think it's going to be tough to beat the Patriots because their offense is going to keep getting better and better. Then after eight games, when will be back? Or is it nine games because he went out? Um, I think it's eight games. Eight games. It all depends on... And they'll get um, Harry back. If too. Harry and Winner are okay, then presumably that'll help the offense. Some people feel that they're trying to open up uh, salary cap money to trade for Stefan Diggs from Minnesota. Diggs has become a lower priority receiver because uh, Cousins is throwing the ball more to Adam Thielen and Diggs is not happy. I mean, obviously you get paid, he's in the contract year and you get paid by number of receptions and, and guys want the touches. So I, I don't know if you want guys who are unhappy about lack of touches, but that's what it looks You're like. You're saying maybe green too, <clears throat> you know, they may be, because Cincinnati's doing terrible. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, yeah. you know they're going to be looking for a receiver. Well, there's a lot of bad teams this year. Obviously, the Patriots haven't beaten anybody yet. Uh, the 49ers really haven't beaten anybody either. So, and the Patriots, this week they play the, the Giants, and the Giants have major injuries. They have Sterling Shepard out, Saquon Barkley's out. So, you know, it's, sometimes it's catching teams at the right time, yeah. too. Just keep getting the victories. That's all that matters right now. It doesn't matter how sharp you are. Right now, it matters when you lost two games. Yeah, it's not like the Olympics. There's no look, style points. Look at last year when they played their best ball in the playoffs. It's you true. Know? So right now, get the victories anyway. And speaking of tight ends, Rob Gronkowski signed a deal uh, with Fox Sports to become an analyst, and he'll be in Foxborough on Thursday as the comment, one of the commentators with the Patriots against the Giants. So. A lot of people think of Gronk as this clown, but he's not. He, maybe he can be a clown when he wants to be, but he's a football savant, and he, he had a lot of his success not only because of his athletic ability, but because of his football smarts. Yeah, he's very smart, and like we were talking earlier, you know, he's, you know, he's a great blocker. He'll be able to talk about that type of blocks you have to make for the running game to get going. Great receiver. I mean, just a great all-around tight end, so... And plus, playing with Brady, he's going to bring a lot to Fox. Right, and I'm sure he has a lot of insight and stories that will add entertainment value for the fans. Uh, there was a survey of NFL executives asking if you had, at this point, if you had to win one game, who, which quarterback would you want? And not surprisingly, of the <coughs> 25 executives, 14 picked Brady. Uh, the second was uh, mm -hmm. Mahomes, and with uh, so it's seven for home, Mahomes and two pick Russell Wilson. Wilson's looked really good this year. Seattle's four and one. Throwing 72%. He's completing 72% of his passes. Wow. So, I mean, you have some, 
The two, two requirements for NFL quarterbacks are decision making and accuracy. Like last night Garoppolo got away with a couple he threw into traffic that just got knocked down or not intercepted. But uh, how did he look? He, he, he managed the game. For the most part, he, um, he was pretty accurate and he didn't have to carry the team. He, ma he made a really great uh, pass to George Kittle, the tight end. T Kittle's a really terrific receiver and also uh, managed to fight for some tough yards. So I was really impressed by his game last night. Kind of interesting, uh, Mookie Betts is no longer on the season ticket page of the Boston Red Sox. Um, so if, if you're going to the Red Sox site looking for season tickets, Betts is persona non grata. So I don't know if, if they're figuring that he's going to be traded or now so, some people think that they'll get more from him if they wait till the trade de deadline when somebody's desperate. What is than, that? Oh, you know, I think it's at the end of June. Oh, next year? Yeah. So. No. I don't know. No, because they're only going to have the guy, him for half a year. Right. No, I, I say right now do it. You, you give him that offer. He says, no, I'm gonna, I want to be, become a free agent. You deal him. You'll get more now because they're going to have him for now to advertise him for the team on the team number one. Maybe get another player to come in because of him. You know, and, and then they'll have him for the spring training. I mean, now I would think I would give him that offer right now if he says, no, I want to wait, trade him, sign Martinez. They better sign Martinez. Well, if they lose both of them, well, it appears that the, the Red Sox first priority is to get under the luxury tax threshold of $208 million, which is still a lot of money. And obviously there are plenty of other teams that have lower payrolls that make the playoffs. Uh, Tampa's hanging on. We'll, we'll see if they can uh, advance or not against Houston. Oh, I'm hoping they do. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I'm so, hoping at least beat them today, <clears throat> tonight, then go back for the fifth game. I know somebody from Minnesota, and he, he's so frustrated because he says that the Twins just absolutely cannot beat the Yankees. You see the plays? Did you watch the game? No, I didn't see it. Oh, what game. plays they made. Torres second made an unbelievable play, playing deep in right field on a smash right by the first baseman, went over, slid, made the play, threw him out. And then Judge made an unbelievable play. The key situation, the Yanks were up 2-0 and they had a man on second, hit a shot to right center, and Judge just went back, kind of like Mookie Betts, and he just went as high as he could, and he snagged the ball. Well, I mean, he's really I mean, the Yankees and Houston team. were the best two teams in the American League, so they, they would be expected to be into the finals. Um, uh, Kyrie Irving was interviewed before the season and sort of apologized saying that he lost his intensity and concentration after the death of his grandfather and let the Celtics down with a lack of leadership. You know, it's not easy for him to say that and you know people athletes are affected by personal issues as well in, in their relationships and in their the rest of their lives, so I don't think it should come as any shock that Irving would, could be affected too. When did his grandfather pass away? Apparently the first half of the season. Oh, so, so that was after um, when they made the playoffs and they were in the seventh game against Cleveland the year before. Right, after and he, that. And he wasn't there for the seventh game because he had to go to the dentist or wherever the heck, <laughs> heck he had to go to. I mean, that was after that, right? The guy's no good. He's not a good teammate. I'm happy he's gone. And I'm really upset at the Celtics right now, and I'm the, their biggest fan. Season tickets, you know, going all games since Bill Russell was playing. This the last year was the most upset I've ever been with the Celtic team. That was a disgrace. It was a disaster. From I'm not going to even include Danny Ainge or the owners. I'm going to start with Stevens. Stevens was a disaster coaching. He didn't control anyone on that team, and it goes right down the whole lineup. They were all a disaster. And right. right now, Ron, it's, it's unbelievable. I can't get into them. Every year I look forward for the Celtics to come. Well, Stop. I think as, we, as we've talked about before, the NBA is a league of stars. The Celtics had unexpected success with uh, Tatum, Brown, and Rozier in the playoffs the year before. They got big heads. They had high expectations about minutes and roles. And then when Haywood and Irving um, came back, 
some of the younger players felt uh, disenfranchised, but they didn't, it wasn't like they were carrying the team. Tatum wasn't great last year. Brown made progress, but he's not an all-star. And Rozier's been dealt off to uh, Charlotte. So we'll see whether a fresh start with some new faces, you know, like, like Cantor and Kemba Walker, will make a difference. But, you know, we're, we're just not into basketball season quite yet. We're going to talk a little bit about football, uh, high school football, that is, as Melrose is off to a very strong start, 4-0. What was the final score in the 28-21. 20, they beat Stoneham, the defending Division VI uh, championship uh, champions, and outstanding football game uh, at home. And Melrose has to be feeling good about themselves. They're, they're ranked second in the MIA uh, Division IV ratings, power ratings, and so far so good. Number nine in the state, right? Nine or 11, I'm not sure. That I, I don't know. Ventura's um, had the ratings, and I think, not, I'm not sure, but they're either ninth or 11th. I mean, they got a real good team. I mean, I don't think they're going to lose a game going into the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, the, the line play has been excellent. They have some very solid skill players. Uh, Sean Herbert had a fumble recovery for a long uh, gain, and uh, Chris Cusolito who's a defensive back and running back also, he, he scored the winning touchdown. We knew he was going to be good when he was a freshman, wasn't he playing mm -hmm. cornerback when he was a freshman? Right. And uh, Brendan uh, Fennell has been really solid at quarterback. So th it wasn't an easy game at all. Stoneham has a kind of an idiosyncratic offense. They have a double tight end, really narrow line spacing, uh, and then they have uh, twin wing backs and they, they have a lot of plays that they run out of that system. And when Melrose played their traditional Oklahoma 4-4 defense, they just had too many blockers to, to handle the, the uh, uh, Melrose uh, defensive scheme. So they, they eventually changed to a 5-3 and mixed it up. And finally, they were able to get some stops. Give, give Stoneham all the credit in the world. They, they did a lot of good things in that football game. They had a lot of those, good, <clears throat> those players back from last year, too, didn't they? That right. running attack? Well, they, they don't have, uh, I think his name was Argyropoulos, who was terrific. But they, they still had a lot of talented players. They run a lot of misdirection plays where they'll pitch to, to one of the wing backs, and then he'll hand off back in the other direction to the other running back. So it was a fun game to watch. And... Uh, a lot of credit goes to, to Coach Morris and his staff. They, they've really had an Did incredible you run. No, I saw it on tape. So overall, really outstanding effort. Um, the uh, they really don't they don't really have a weakness. They special teams were good. They, they, whoever was kicking off, I'm not sure was was getting it inside the 10 yard line. Uh, one characteristic of Coach Moe's teams is they they don't turn the ball over very much and they they were able to force a couple of key turnovers uh, by Stoneham so that was a key and they don't take a lot of stupid penalties. They they have two more games before the playoffs. Uh, I think it's three. Three more. Right. So they'll definitely be in the in the playoff hunt and you know hopefully they'll have a deep run as they have uh, you know That's all, a heck of almost a program. every year. What a program over the last ten years. Right, it's, it's been really fantastic. I uh, want to give a little story. I had a discussion with a coach recently about uh, uh, the game was totally out of control. His team was losing 62 to seven and against a, a prep school team that had three, six, seven guys uh, playing for him. And he went over to the other coach and said, you thinking about putting any subs in? And the coach said, no, I don't think so. The kids like, like it this way. So I heard another story. A coach said in that situation, all he did was after the other team scored, he, he took, had his kids take the ball out of bounds and just throw it to the other team. And he yelled at the other coach, I'll stop doing it when, you get, when you're satisfied that you're winning by enough. Where was this game? This was up in uh, uh, Maine. So, you know, it, Fortunately, we haven't been on the losing side of those too often, but it's kind of sad when 
people feel compelled to run up the score in, in obvious blowout situations. I mean, I've been part of that both <clears> ways. <throat> I've had teams that have blown out other teams, and you, of course you put the subs in, the people, players that don't play as much, and um, you don't press anymore, you don't fast break when you're up so many points. But I've never got upset about a team that's beat my team big. No, I really they keep pressing. Right, I don't have any problems. If, if somebody's beating us that badly with the press, we obviously need practice against the press. So it's our job to not get blown out. It's not their job to, to uh, feel sorry for us. You know my biggest problem with basketball, with youth sports, any, with youth basketball. My biggest problem, and you know, I really have a beef with um, these teams playing zones in youth sports, I mean youth basketball. That's a complete disgrace, and I can't believe the higher-ups. One league did it, um, Winchester in a tournament when I was coaching years ago in their tournament, youth basketball, you couldn't have no zones at all. Wow. But the, any youth sports they should do to at basketball. We'll talk more about youth sports. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Melrose Volleyball continues to uh, have a strong season. They're 10 and 2 at this point. They lost a tough one, 3 to 1, over at Winchester the other day. Winchester's undefeated. Um, Winchester's really become a powerhouse in the Middlesex League. And what's interesting about the Middlesex League is in non league games this year, Middlesex League teams are 16 and 5. Winchester beat Barnstable. Um, I think Reading beat. Andover, I think so. Yeah, they did. The, right, so the the strength throughout the league has really improved dramatically. So that should bode well for Melrose in the playoffs. Melrose's other losses to Burlington, and they'll get a chance to face them again uh, in a couple of weeks at home. So another strong uh, season for a very ex experienced team uh, on the volleyball side, and it looks like uh, the cross country teams have been doing really well. I see that field hockey's won a few games and 
soccer's won a few games, so. Well, the boys like, are 500 now, aren't they, in soccer? Yeah, I think so. So it looks like the fall sports teams are, are coming along. And, uh, I mean, it's hard to be strong in everything. So overall, uh, the athletes, parents, and the athletic department should feel pretty good about how things are going. What was the problem, though, when the... Um Winchester game for Melrose. You went to it, right? Yeah, I went to the game. Uh, Winchester just made more plays than Melrose did. Uh, but why didn't Melrose make more plays than Winchester? What was the problem? I don't know. With all the talent they have. Mel Melrose, was, Melrose got uh, beaten badly in the first set. They lost 25-10. They came back strong to, to win the second, 25-17. The third set, Melrose got off to a bad start and lost 25-20. And they got off to a bad start in the fourth set, we're trailing 19 to 13, and they got even at uh, 24. But Winchester had uh, a, a really dominant setter, a girl named Dasha Smolina, who was a terrific player, terrific setter, terrific passer, terrific. She could hit the ball, and she had a lot of skill. Winchester must have scored 25 points on little dinks into the middle. Melrose just couldn't defend that. So, and. Uh, also, Winchester scored a lot of points out of hit attacks out of the middle. So, um, mostly Melrose will double block the outside hitters and single block the middle. You know, I, if they're going to play them again, I, I think they might consider double blocking the middle some. But it's, it's not something you can just do on the fly. You have to practice it. Well, Winchester's Division One now, right? Right. Winchester's so Division One. So Melrose won't face one. them in a tournament. No, they won't have them. The, the undefeated team in Division uh, Two North is Linfield. Linfield's uh, won the Division Two North uh, title last year, and they're strong again this year. So it looks like it'll be Merrill's Linfield Burlington. I would say so. Last year it was Linfield and Burlington in the final. So it's uh, as they say in uh, Casablanca, the usual suspects that are back every year. Interesting. Uh, legal development in college sports, the California Fair pay, play, pay to Play Act, so that player likenesses, uh, the players could be reimbursed. Now, if you're the wrestler or golfer or relief pitcher, you're not getting anything. There's gonna be a select few star players, probably in football and basketball, they're going to make a little money, but not probably very big money. I don't think that's going to work. It's going to be in three or four years, they're saying anyway. How about an offensive line? the offensive linemen that are killing themselves, you know, making holes for the running backs, you know, to make them look good, and the running backs are going to be getting big money and they're getting nothing at all. I mean, how's that going to work? I, don't, I can't believe the coaches are going to go along with that. Well, I think there's, there's some feeling that, college athletes in selected sports like baseball or um, golf already can participate and earn and have earnings so it's it's making it fair for athletes in other sports and if you're a cello player in college you can give cello concerts and get paid or if you're a singer you can sing and get paid so why is it that just uh, other uh, students can't get paid for what they do. Well, what I, what I believe it, and it's tough to do because you have Notre Dame who's making a ton of money in those big schools, but why not an expense, expense account and give the players so much money well, for the week? What, what you saw immediately from the NCAA with Mark Emmert as commissioner is they said this was a terrible idea. Well, they want to keep all the money for themselves, obviously. Today, Krzyzewski was out saying that he's in favor of the, pl the players being able to uh, get compensated. F f you know, and obviously, the teams like Duke or Kentucky, um, the, the biggest blue chip programs are the ones that are going to benefit the most from it because their players are going to be the ones who get the publicity and the pay. You know, I've been talking about how the owners are really not good people. I mean, you could see what they've done with the steroids. They're letting that go. You know, they had the concussions. They weren't doing anything about it until all the publicity. Now these coaches like Krzyzewski, right? He wasn't, he, now he's all for the players, right? You know, one and done. Now he's saying they, they shouldn't even have to come to college. They should be able to go right into the pros. 
Why? Because he wants to get in the good side of the parents and the players. That's right. the reason why he's doing it. Right. Uh, over a decade ago, he was totally against uh, Calipari and Kentucky saying it's a joke that these uh, players could go to college for a year. And then once he adopted it, then he obviously didn't have anything else to say about it. No, oh, it's not so easy because you still have to attract the players and you have to have uh, success. And I know that the Kentucky players have made hundreds of millions of dollars by doing, going the one and done route. So Calipari, it's easy for him to go and say, look at uh, Anthony Davis or whomever has, has made big money. So if you come to Kentucky for a year, your, your child have a chance to sign a big contract and that'll be good for your family. Well, can't argue with that. You know what else really bothers me a lot? You know about these parents that have paid money for to get oh, their sure. kids into these colleges, if it's, you know, Southern Cal or whatever. Or, um, you look at that, right, and they're being prosecuted. And you look at these politicians in Washington who do favors for these schools so their kids can get into the school, you know, and they do a ton of favors. And you look at that, they're worse than these parents that are paying money. Well, um, and these parents are going to jail now, and I'm against that, right? I mean, it's wrong. Well, I think if you but look, how about the politicians? Right? Well, I think the, what, the problem wasn't that you were giving money because people have always been able, been giving money, and so if you give a million dollars for some building or project statue of yourself, then uh, your kid will get preference. The problem was some of these kids were being recruited as athletes, and the only, the only time they'd ever seen the sport was, you know, oh. they had their 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 face photoshopped on somebody else's body or something. But what the politicians are doing, it's way worse than what these, these parents, it's bad. They should be prosecuted and whatever they get, they get. Or if they change the kids' but, SAT but scores. But the politicians, no one's saying anything about them. It's unbelievable what they're doing. This kid's in Yale, right? His grades were like, a, I guess one kid had like a, a B average through high school, and he's going to Yale. I mean, it's well, ridiculous. I think it was in uh, the book Animal Farm that there's a quote that all animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. And, uh, you know, we know that uh, Jared Kushner's family paid two and a half million dollars for him to go to Harvard. So, you know, that's if you have the money and you can buy something, if you're rich enough, then well, there it, yeah, there it, is, there right it there. is. So not much you can do about that. Uh, Pro Football Focus picked their quarter season all pro team, which I'm not sure what, exactly why that's necessary, but two Patriots were on that, uh, Jamie Collins and Devin McCourty. So McCourty's leading the league in uh, interceptions with four, and Collins has three. I mean, obviously they've been playing nobody, but... Well, Jason kept the streak going for the McCourty's, <laughs> right? Right. So... Um, you know, the Patriots are setting all kinds of records that haven't been seen for 30 years defensively as far as points per game, and they haven't given up a passing touchdown yet this season. But, of course, the, the teams they're playing haven't been, been very good, and it looks like the Giants, absent their key players, should be another win for them this week. Who have been the top three players on the Patriots so far? Well, I think Hightower, when he's, when he's been healthy, has I mean, he was this year. Yeah, phenomenal. He's, he's been terrific. Um, I think that in the, uh, Gilmore hasn't been quite as good as he, he was previously. He had a he, bad game yeah. the last two games. But, he, but he's, st he's still very good. And uh, Van Noy has been exceptional at linebacker. So to me, those are three. The guy that doesn't get noticed who's really good every game is Guy. He, he just plugs the up the whole middle. defense is playing great. Right. Offensively, I wouldn't say that much has been great. Edelman's been, been very solid. Um, you know, the offensive line, shaky. Uh, we know that Goskowski's supposed to have hip surgery. I don't know if he has a labrum tear or what he has, but then they brought in Nugent and he wasn't any, any great shakes. <laughs> this is the first extra point, and he gets bangs one in off the post later. Um, so we'll see. See, I'd go, I'd go Brady. Num people think I'm crazy. I'd go Brady number one. He's been the best player. Hightower number two, and Collins number three. The reason why I say Brady number one, even though the schedule has been easy, he was thrown 67%. He was completing 67% of his passes before the Buffalo game. He 
completed 67% of his passes Sunday. So you take that one game out, that was a terrible game all around for the whole team. And he's a quarterback. I mean, you have a quarterback who's completing 67% of his passes. Right now he has 10 touchdowns, two interceptions. Should be better there. But you're talking about a quarterback compared to a defensive player who just, I mean, it's a whole different story. You know, the mental part of the game and everything. So that's why I well, the, say Brady. The, the argument is about who's been their, <laughs> their top rookie, and probably it's been Bailey. I mean, he's, he's really been effective. I think. How about the kickoffs? Yeah, I mean. Every one of his kickoffs Sunday, I think he had seven or eight kickoffs, none of them were returned. Yeah, he, I mean, he, he's a weapon, no, no question about it. And he, he seems to be able to directionally punt. He's, and he's put, yeah, right out of bounds, you know, perfect. You know, and, you know, especially I'm, near the end of the half, Belichick says, I don't want a guy running back a punt for a touchdown, just kick it out of bounds, you know, down the field. So uh, can't, uh, can't fault him for that. And last year at Stanford, he only had two kickoffs that were returned the whole so, season. That's out right. of 13 games, right. just so, two. So when people said, well, they spent a fifth round draft choice on a punter, why do they do that? Because that's the reason why they did that. And because field position is really important, especially if you have a, a solid defense. Yeah, with that defense, <laughs> they're playing unreal. And, uh, you know, we'll see. I think Winovich is, he must have had at least two sacks this year. And I think he has four now. Okay. He had one last game too. He, he, has, he plays with a really low pad level, so he seems to be able to get underneath uh, people on the, from the outside. But they got to do schemes with him, too. All of his rushes are from the outside, and he tries to beat them. Let him come inside at times. With his quickness, those, line, those offensive linemen won't be able to adjust quick enough. I'd say if we looked at the – a lot of people argue that the Patriots are in the weakest division in the NFL every year, and, you know, it's hard to argue that this year especially. But as far as the strongest, I think the uh, NFC West is really strong right now with San Francisco, Seattle's four and one, the, the Rams are three and two, and Arizona, I think, is one, three and one, but I think they've, they've played a little bit better than that. Kyler Murray you know, has pretty good prospects to help make them better this year. Hey, just get that number one seed. Right now it's looking great because Kansas City has a couple of tough games coming up. They lose one more game, Patriots win their next three, you know, and then they have that home game against Kansas City. You win that one, you get the number one seed wrapped up. They'll have Buffalo at home. Buffalo's four and one, but you got to figure they're not going with their offense. They're going to lose games. Yeah, Buffalo. The Josh Allen is just a turnover machine. The, the Patriots proved that against them. Now, if Buffalo changes their scheme maybe, trying to get shorter passes, throw more to the backs, throw underneath. I mean, Allen just keeps trying to force the ball down the field and he's not that accurate, hasn't made a lot of good decisions. Or, or maybe they could, uh, you know, what if they traded for somebody like Eli Manning? I mean, Eli Manning as a game manager might be able to do something for them. Yeah, but you won't, them. they won't, they, Buffalo? Yeah. No, nah, they, won't, they won't go for him. No, they're probably committed He's 38. to 38. I know. Well, you mean for the next two years? No, I'm just saying for this year. So, I mean, obviously the Giants have committed to Daniel Jones, and I mean he's been good, but Manning won't go anywhere. Does he? Doesn't he have that no trade contract? I don't know. I don't think they can trade him. I think they, if I heard that right, they did. They were talking about it, and they said no, they can't. It was interesting. The first four weeks of the season, the Patriots only uh, used the two-back formation two plays. And uh, this, this week they used it on 57% of the snaps. And uh, you know, I made a comment during the game uh, on Twitter to Greg Bedard of Boston Sports Journal that uh, Jakob Johnson was really good. I mean, he, he really had some great blocks, uh, wham blocks, and Michelle had a very big uh, second half. I think he had 78 yards on 10 carries, something like that. So. I'm not saying the guy's going to be an all-pro fullback, but he's, he's stepped in capably last week, at least, for Devlin. Yeah, and White looked good. White looked good on a couple of runs. Right. You know, the funny thing is, White looked quicker, shiftier, you know, on his runs. He had, you know, I think he had two or three real good runs where, you know, 
he, he just looks quicker than the rest of them, except for uh, Burkhead. When Burkhead well, gets a hole, he well, Burkhead was it. out. He had yeah. You he's know, been out the last two games. He's, he's always hurt. He's always hurt. So but he's a perfect guy for that team because you have other running backs. Right. When he's healthy, you know, he's going to be back. And then Damian Harris also has uh, been hurt. Now, the, the complaint about Sony Michel is he only gets what's blocked. Well, I mean, if there's no blocking, what are you going to get? Probably not very much. No runner will. No, right. But I thought that the other difference for him this week is he was a factor in the passing game. He had three receptions three. for 32 yards, and he, he actually looked like a guy who could catch the ball out of the backfield, which is, at least if he's in there, usually if he's in there, they don't throw to him, so it'll make uh, a little bit more of a choice for the, uh, the uh, defense. But I, th I think that people are going to see with um, Izzo and Lacoste and now throwing, you know, to really seven different receivers in last game, I and mean, that's going to add a lot because remember we, we, the last show when we talked about it, I, I go, Brady doesn't have confidence in his tight ends. I think he's starting to get it because he's been working with them. I think we're going to start seeing that. Well, the, the passes he completed to the tight ends were wide open. I mean, guys were, I mean, they were able to get open. But like I said, if Brady wasn't rushed those two times when Lacoste was wide open and Brady had to throw it quick and he threw it low, I mean, his three receptions for Lacoste, yeah, you know, Right, and, and we all, if a guy has a bad game, we just assume that he can't play or he's a stiff. And my guess is that a lot of times guys are just really hurt and they're doing the best they can under the circumstances. Um, Cannon's always hurt. He's got the bad foot. He had a bad game too last Shaq, game. Shaq Mason, I'm sure he's hurt because he really hasn't been playing well. So it's hard to know exactly how he's hurt. And, you know, uh, not having Andrews at center makes a big difference. Karras has done a good job on the snaps. He's not throwing those pop-ups anymore. But uh, He's doing a good job, Block. He gets called for holding once in a while, but I watch him. He's, he's big and tough. Right. It'll, it'll be interesting to see if, if Andrews can come back. Uh, a lot will depend on whether he's got a hereditary clotting disorder or not, and I'm sure the Patriots know that by now. But uh, I we'll think Wynn's the key guy. You put Wynn over there with Tooney. Karras is playing good in the middle, you know, on the other side with Mason and Cannon. And then you've got, to hope to, you've got to hope the tight ends keep improving. Do you think there's a prayer that they'll re-sign Tooney, or do you think he's a no, I think free agent? They'll probably re-sign him. They're going to have a lot of money next year, you know, especially with that $9 million they blew on Brown. Right. You know, they, oh, they will, you know, they'd have that now. They'd have $13 million right now. So... Well, we'll see. We'll be right back. One of the big issues in sports these days is load management. And the question is, how much rest or strategic game absences are, are helping players versus making them upset because they can't put up big numbers? And we've heard that Michael Bennett, who's playing about 40% of the snaps, isn't happy, feels like he's not playing enough. On the other hand, if you don't play as much, you don't get hurt, and presumably you have more in your tank later in the season when other guys are getting worn down or already hurt. You know, you know Belichick, right? You, you either play, play the way he wants you to play or you're going to sit. Last game, I think he played less than that. He wasn't out there that much. He was in there on one sack, I think, with, with someone else. But, you know, he must not be doing what he wants him to do, his techniques or whatever. He might be playing like an individual, you know, player and... He's not covering different gaps. Well, he said that uh, Shelton, Danny Shelton's played a lot more this year because he always tried to rush straight upfield and get sacks, and that's not what the Patriots want. They want you to just fill the gap, let the linebackers make the tackle. They don't really care if you, if you get sacks from the middle. Um, obviously, for years, Vince Wilfork filled up the middle, and now with uh, Shelton and Guy, they've, they've done a great job against the run so far this year. Butler's played real well, too. Yeah. Butler's had a real good year. I mean, they're all playing good. You know, they're all doing a real good job, so I mean, there's got to be something there. He's a great pass rusher, but they're getting great pass rushes. Well, well you see in the secondary, Jason mccourty has been better than expected at the corner opposite Gilbert. Jonathan Jones has been really good, and J.C. Jackson seems like he's always around the ball. Now, uh, they were fortunate in... Uh, was it Jackson who hit uh, 
Josh Allen the game before, or was it Jonathan Jones? I can't remember. Jonathan Jones. All right. So now Jones is about 185 pounds, and Josh Allen is 238 pounds, and Allen was running trying to get a first down, and Jones hit him high. It was helmet to helmet, but he, I mean, he was a runner. It so, shouldn't have been a penalty. Right. A lot of people have said that you can look at it two ways, that Allen was lowering his head. Allen initiated the contact. You know, there was nothing. If you watched, Jones was trying to turn his helmet. It was Allen's fault, and, but they, didn't, fi no, no, they didn't, didn't fine him. He didn't get a fine. So conversely, if you want to talk about fines, uh, Vontae's perfect, who is... He's got to lead the universe in fines. He's, at last uh, reading, he was suspended for the year for a, a guy who was just pretty much down, kneeling on the field, and he just clocked I him. I wonder if he's ever going to play again. People saying he should not play. He's out there to hurt you. He's, you're right. He's only about 29 years old, but he's, he's taken so many bad hits through the years. I mean, you, you sort of have to wonder if the guy is mentally right. I know. How about Oakland, though? They're three and two. Well, you know, as I said before, in That's Mike Lombardi's book, he said most people don't want to play for John Gruden because if you win, Gruden's there taking all the credit, and if you lose, he blames it on the players. So, you know, the, the Raiders looked pretty happy last week, defeated a very good Chicago Bear team. And uh, so we'll see. I mean, the, the West, um, you know, obviously is the Los Angeles Chargers haven't been doing great. Denver, I think, has only won one game. Right. And Kansas City is, is the, the strongest team out there. So, um, you know, we'll see. I mean, I, I'm not a huge Philip Rivers guy. I, people, I've never been. I mean, no, me either. He's not a winner. But people are always talking about Philip Rivers like he's a Hall of Fame quarterback. What has he ever won? You know, even back when he had uh, those real good teams, he never came true in the big games. You know, I mean, he is Brady and is everyone else as far as I'm concerned. Well, it'll be interesting to see if Roethlisberger can come back uh, after, I mean, everybody said he's had Tommy John surgery. I don't know if he actually did. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough rehab. And at his age, you know, with the amount of money he's made, at some point, sometimes people say it's not really worth it. You know, but you know, you never want to leave after an injury, though. I mean, if he's back healthy, I think he's going to come back. Even though two years ago he was thinking about retiring. So you really don't know, but... Well, I guess we can talk a little bit about baseball. You probably have insight into the Yankees. Uh, you know, I mean, the Yankees have as good a chance as anybody else to win. Well, you have, you know, Verland, that he, you got two best pitches in the American League with yeah, Houston. Verlander and Cole. Are so Verlander has to pick t pitch tonight, though. I don't know what happens if they win tonight when they play. It's got to be later on this week. So Verlander, if Verlander misses the first two starts, which I don't think he will because they'll give him a break. It probably would not start until Saturday. They so then he'd have... So they'd probably have Saturday, Monday, Sunday. Thursday, yeah, because they're not going to play two games... Friday, Saturday. So he'll pitch the second game. So they'll have the top two pitches going against the Yankees. I don't know what the Yankees will do. I know Paxson will start the first game. And you know, will it be Severino or will it be Tanaka? Now, Herman Sever is out, right? Herman's out. That was a big loss. I mean, that's no. a shame. But Severino looked good yesterday. He pitched four innings. He got in the gym, bases loaded, no outs in the second. And he got out of it. And then they had first and second twice, and he really got it through really good curveballs, and he's throwing his fastball up near 99 miles an hour. You know, but he looked good, so I don't know what they'll do with in the second game if it'll be Tanaka or him. Probably really doesn't matter. That's right. going to be a seven-game series. It's going to be a battle. I mean, I'm no. looking at the Yankees lineup. It all comes down to are going to do the best they can. I mean, you got guys like Sanchez who could have a terrible series. You got Stanton who could have a terrible series. They both had terrible series last year. You know, you got them in the lineup instead of having Voight, you know, in there instead of Stanton who makes contact and who has power. And so, but they have a heck of a lineup. They, they have um, two of their best hitters hitting eight and nine. Marcelo's hitting nine. Well, they probably and, wish that they didn't have Stanton now. 
you know, I don't know if they have any, if he has any trade value or his salary is too high. That could be a disaster. I mean, is, is he going to, is he going to come up in key situations? He's batting fifth behind Incarnacion. You know, is he going to come up in key situations and strike out and not hit the ball? You know, if he does that consistently against Houston, the Yanks are going to have a tough time. You know, Sanchez strikes out a lot. I mean, those are the two keys because they're either going to have do nothing or maybe get a big – they they both have power. So they're going to hit a home run in a key situation. My feeling with both of them is that they're going to hurt them. You know, they're going to really hurt them, and then they're going to, they're going to realize that Voigt should have probably played. Yeah, it, the worst part about baseball this year is the games, if it's, if it's in New York or in, in October or Boston when the Red Sox are playing, it's, it's – who wants to be sitting in the stands when it's 45 degrees? I know. It's, it's, it's pretty tough. And it can't be any fun to be playing if it's 45. It's different if you're playing in Houston or Dodger Stadium. Remember when we were younger? The games were in the afternoon. Right. The playoffs, the big Remember games. In, in the World Series in games. In 1967, in uh, sixth grade, they had the, literally, we're still in school, and they had the baseball game on the, the PA system in the school. Sounds crazy, but... Uh, Anyway, again, that was another era. I don't think they no. do that anymore. When my kids were, when we lived in Washington, when the kids were little, they, they'd say the Pledge of Allegiance and they'd sing Hail to the Redskins before school. So when you think about, when you think about crazy, crazy fans, I think about Notre Dame, I think about the Redskins, um, Nebraska back in the day, not so much right now, but you know, and, Around here, obviously, people make fun of the BC fans with their whale pants and everything. But uh, anyway, it's... Uh, but the, the, the craziest game I've been to... Well, I was there when Halichick stole the ball. Right. I was at that game. And that was nuts. But the noise factor when the Celtics beat the Lakers at home in the seventh game back in the 80s, it was unbelievable. We're sitting in the stadium seats. As a matter of fact, we're sitting four rows behind Red Auerbach. And that, before the game, players were coming up to Auerbach and he was giving them tickets. And he said, Havlicek, um, Ted Kennedy with his son, the one who lost his leg, and a, mm -hmm. he was there with his son. And um, he gave Ted Kennedy two tickets. Auerbach had like, you know, he had a ton of tickets. And he told, pointed down to Ted Kennedy. Then Hank Finkel comes in. I still remember it. He gives Finkel, Finkel's there with his kid, he gives him two tickets and he points up to the balcony. I mean, every Henry Finkel was, <laughs> uh, was uh, in our office one day, he was in the building. He's a good he guy. Was looking, yeah, he was looking for a flu shot. And uh, because his next door neighbor was Dr. Haynes. So he had Henry Haynes and Henry Finkel anyway. So Finkel's looking for a flu shot. And he, I think Dr. Haynes said, why don't you go over and see Ron? Maybe he's got one. So he walks in the door. And I, and I shake his hand and say, wow, I'm so excited to see you, Mr. Finkel. I've never met an office furniture magnet before. <laughs> so he just broke out laughing. After his professional career, he got into office furniture. But really nice guy. Um, run into him a few times through the years. And not that he would remember me, but he, he's always been pleasant. The nicest athlete I've ever met. I mean, I, I spent like three hours with Cowens when I was bartending. He came in for a, a wedding, and he was at the bar most of the night, just, you know, just talking. I talked to him for a long time. We talked about the All-Star game when he had a big first half, and then they didn't get him the ball in the second half because they didn't want him to be the MVP. He started laughing. But the, the nicest guy I ever met was Ron Burton, Steve Burton's father. Mm -hmm. Ron Burton, he was an unbelievable person. You know, I, t I remember talking to him for about an hour, it was amazing. You know, I was younger when I was talking to him, and they still have the Ron Burton Award. Well, right. I was going to say the Patriots have the Ron Burton Award. Years, years ago, my, this tells you something about the National Football League. My, my daughters played, I won't name, name the, the player, but they played with a former Patriots daughter, and we were t chatting with his wife, and I, and I asked his wife, I said, did your husband have any particular rituals or superstitions before the game? And she said, yeah, he really liked to file his nails really sharp so he could gouge the receivers' faces. So I'm here like, oh, the National Football League. Boy, it's really tough. 
Um, I visited with uh, Coach Lane, former uh, athletic director at Melrose. He was a longtime basketball coach in Wakefield. He's in the uh, New England Basketball Hall of Fame, and he was talking about his early years in Wakefield. And he said that there wasn't a lot of support for basketball. There were a lot of people who were kind of football people and baseball people, but basketball just wasn't a priority. So anyway, there was a, after tryouts, he had cut a player and he said, you know, what, he said it was a really nice kid. I really liked him, but he wasn't a really good basketball player, so he got cut. And the, unfortunately, Coach Lane, I don't think he knew that it was a local politician's son. So the politician kind of had it out for him. So uh, he would come to the game and he said he'd have a clipboard and he's writing down all these things all the time. He must have thought coaching errors. So he said, I think I'm going to get fired in the middle of the season. He never said it to us. And he said, we went on a 13 game winning streak. So he said, so I didn't get fired. <laughs> so I guess uh, winning always helps immunize you from being fired. And after the Patriots beat Jay Gruden's team this week, he got fired. Um, now, I would imagine probably the next person on the chopping block might be Dan Quinn down in Atlanta, because Atlanta is really, after that, <laughs> 20, after 28 to three, they've just totally fell apart. That's amazing. I mean, it's, it's destroyed them. In it's Seattle, like a, also didn't fall apart like them. But once, you know, when they lost that game to the Patriots in the Super Bowl, they weren't the same team. No, and mm -hmm. I think that's a real thing, that sometimes people get psychologically destroyed by a, a key loss. But that's why you got to praise Belichick and, you know, and Brady. I mean, for what they've done, the tough losses they've had. Those oh, two sure. giant losses were real tough losses because both of those games they could have won easily. Right, and one, one of the discussions that comes up regularly online is, is Eli Manning a Hall of Fame quarterback because he won two Super Bowls? And... He's in the top 10 in passing uh, for a lot of things, yards, completions, all that stuff, because for the long, longevity. So the more I think about it, the more I say yes. I mean, he won two Super Bowls. He was the MVP. How many Super Bowls have there been? Right. No, you know, so was it 40? How many Super Bowls? Well, they're 50, in the low 50s. 50 yeah. 50 something now? Yeah, no, I mean, so. He's I, won two of them. Right. So I think that that's probably right that he will get in. Um, will he get in the first? ballot? I don't know. Uh, you know, if you talk about former Patriots who are not in, who we'd expect to get in, if you said... McGinnis? I think McGinnis has a shot. If, if you said there's one guy who's sure to get in, who will it be? Is Hannah in it? Yeah, he's in. Oh, Tay, uh, Brady. Well, how about former players, retired players? Well, I guess that's not really true because he's not retired. I'd say Vinatieri is a shoe in yeah. to get in. I think he's the all-time NFL scoring leader. He's like 87 years old now. He's still kicking. I, th I think McGinnis should get in it. Seymour maybe. It'll be interesting to see if Rodney Harrison gets in because a lot of time before he came to the Patriots, he was considered a really dirty player. I think he's going to get in, even though Van Roy doesn't like him. Well, it, it probably, he probably has, going for him, he's rehabilitating his reputation by being on television. So he, he's pr pretty good at doing the commentary on Sunday Night Football. So, you know, we'll see. And will, do you think Brewski's got a shot? No. I love Brewski. Brewski, he was one of the players that played to the best of his abilities, but I don't think he'll get in the Hall of Fame. He, was, uh, he only made the Pro Bowl one time, I mm -hmm. believe. All right. How about Will Fork? Do you think he's got a shot? No. There you have it. No. So I've enjoyed being with you tonight. I'm Ron Sen. And I'm Ralph LaBella. And thank you for watching Let's Talk Sports. <laughs>